This is LBC with Nick Abbott. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Okay, coming up, more of your experiences with customer service, and uh, if you think it has uh, sort of gone off a cliff uh, lately, what your uh, experiences, uh, whether you have been delighted or appalled by your experience of customer services, and um, if it's been bad, then why do you think that is? But first, let's go to America and talk to Simon Marks, who uh, joins us from Washington, D.C. Hello, Simon. Good evening, Nick. Uh, so much to talk about. I know. First off, um, let's just um, mention Lloyd Austin. He's the Defence Secretary. He's in hospital. What's up with him? Uh, yes, he was uh, rushed back to hospital uh, a few hours ago. You'll remember that Lloyd Austin disappeared for a while over the Christmas period. Uh, belatedly, we learnt that he had been uh, suffering from some kind of emergency relating to prostate cancer treatment that he received. He kept everyone in the dark at the time, including his boss, President Biden, and other senior figures within the administration. Well, earlier today, uh, Lloyd Austin was transported back to hospital uh, after suffering some kind of setback. Uh, and tonight, this is uh, just in, the Pentagon has announced that he is still at hospital, receiving treatment, and has transferred the functions and duties of his office to the Deputy Secretary of Defense, Kathleen Hicks. Now, remember last time round, we didn't know anything uh, about what Lloyd Austin was going through, uh, nor indeed was there a formal process of transferring uh, his duties. Some of them were transferred to his deputy, but even she wasn't told why, and she certainly was unaware that he was in hospital. He had promised at a press conference a few days ago that he was going to do better uh, in the future, and certainly the Pentagon has been providing uh, much more information at the moment, I think there will be concern uh, about the nature of the uh, ailment uh, that has laid Lloyd Austin low again here tonight, uh, and concern, frankly, based on what we all saw when he made his first public appearance uh, at the Pentagon a few days ago, because he was clearly in discomfort. He was walking very slowly. There was a golf cart outside the room that they were using to transport him uh, around those long corridors in the Department of Defense building the Pentagon just south of uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, so clearly uh, things are problematic for him health-wise again, uh, and we will wait to, to see uh, how that treatment progresses and what we learn in the days ahead. And of course he's been very busy lately. He's been to uh, Israel, and uh, you know that's very much on the minds of the administration. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And of course, I mean, there's ongoing uh, conflict, right? I mean, the United States, uh, together with the UK, continuing to target Houthi rebels in Yemen in a bid to try and protect uh, merchant vessels in the Red Sea from the threat that they pose. Uh, plus, of course, the United States uh, continuing to take reprisals for the killing of three American service personnel in Jordan, uh, targeted by a drone that the United States says was backed, uh, launched by proxy of Iran. Just a few days ago, the US claimed to have uh, killed uh, the leader of the principal resistance group backed by Iran, uh, said to be responsible for that assault. So, uh, I mean, and, and this was one of the reasons why it was so astonishing, I mean, baffling, frankly, that Lloyd Austin completely disappeared from view uh, over the New Year period, because again, I mean, there were, there were military actions being planned uh, and being taken. They said earlier today when he went to the hospital that he'd taken all of his communications equipment with him and that he was still very much on duty but clearly something has happened within the last few hours uh, for them to draw the conclusion that that is no longer viable uh, which is why everything's been put in hands of in the hands of the deputy and also a breaking news story um in houston there's a, a celebrity pastor's mega church that was um well the, su the subject of a, a of yet another shooting Yes, absolutely. This took place at the big mega church in Houston, the Lakewood uh, Church, where the celebrity pastor, I think you'd have to call him, Joel Osteen, who's a huge figure, not just in Texas, but particularly across the American South, uh, with the evangelical uh, and born-again community. Uh, he, They were between services uh, there this afternoon. They just finished one massive service, and this church seats 45,000 
thousand people. I mean, this is a massive complex in Houston. Uh, they were about to begin their Spanish language service when a woman uh, walked into the church, accompanied by a five-year-old boy. She was carrying a rifle of some kind, what they describe here as a long gun. She was wearing a trench coat and had a backpack in which she claimed that she had an explosive device, although they've found no evidence to support that claim in the aftermath. She started shooting uh, police officers at the scene already uh, on duty there, because as I say, it's a massive uh, complex, so there, there is always security there. Uh, they engaged and killed uh, her... Uh, unfortunately, the five-year-old boy was also caught in crossfire and is now in critical condition in hospital. And I think one other person at the church uh, was slightly grazed and wounded by bullets and has also uh, been transported to hospital. She also claimed uh, that she had some kind of um, a chemical device that she was spraying over the floor of the church. Uh, and the fire uh, chief said a short while ago that they have not found any evidence to support the claim that it was something that she could ignite but they are continuing to search the church all services have been suspended down there tonight uh, to make sure that there's no one else involved in all of this uh, not just in terms of orchestrating this assault the motive for which is a complete mystery we don't know if she was a church member we have absolutely no idea why uh, she carried out this attack but they're also want to make sure that nobody else is uh, injured and sheltering in place and seeking any kind of medical attention so the investigation in its early stages um that church you know definitely because it's such a landmark uh, right in the middle of the american southwest absolutely as always i think as far as joel Osteen is concerned been considered a possible target which is why they've got so much security uh on deck every sunday for their major services and then throughout the week it's a massive business very very politically connected in texas and beyond uh, and the response was was immediate by the emergency services. The mayor was there tonight talking, the head of the police, the head of the fire brigade, uh, and, of course, uh, the pastor himself. So we'll see where that investigation heads. Right. Now, Tucker Carlson went to Russia. Tucker Carlson used to be the, um, the, 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 the number one rated host on cable news. He used to be the biggest name at Fox News, and uh, he was ousted for uh, various uh, reasons, and he's now doing his own thing on... Um, where is it he does his own thing now? Well, he does his own thing on his own website. He set right, up his okay. own sort of network, but then they, they effectively also put it out over uh, whatever Elon Musk is currently calling <laughs> Twitter. Right. So he's still a big, big name in America. Gets yes. millions of views. And he went to Russia to interview Vladimir Putin. What's been the fallout from that? Well, uh, a, a lot of fallout because, of course, this is the first interview that Vladimir Putin has given to an American journalist in ages, certainly the first interview since uh, he uh, launched his invasion uh, of Russia. This is an interview that, I'm just looking at it now, has been viewed at least partially, and it goes on for uh, over two hours. Uh, at least some of it has been viewed 193 million times. Uh, I think it's fair to say that there is absolutely absolute fury among orthodox foreign policy observers here in the United States that Tucker Carlson essentially provided Vladimir Putin with an open microphone and largely uh, did not challenge him. Indeed, the first answer to the first question, and the first question is, why did you invade Ukraine? Vladimir P Putin speaks uninterrupted for half an hour, and I mean, basically goes back to the primordial slime uh, and tells the entire history of Russia from his perspective mm. in order to try and explain why uh, he invaded Ukraine. Yeah. Now, look... He said it was going to be a brief history lesson, didn't he? Then, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Anyone went on for 30 minutes. <laughs> uh, I suspect there are not many Americans uh, that were still uh, watching yeah. at the end of that 30-minute exposition. Um, but there are questions being raised here as to uh, precisely how this interview came about. Tucker Carlson says that he covered all his own expenses... Was there any kind of pr quid pro quo uh, in exchange for this interview? And, uh, I mean, the other galling thing is that in the preamble to it, in the, you know, the advertising a couple of days ahead of time, Tucker Carlson was insisting that American journalists and Western journalists just hadn't bothered to interview Vladimir Putin. Mm. So he 
decided he needed to do it. I mean, the reality is every single major news organization there and here has been asking the Kremlin for interviews with Vladimir Putin week in, week out for months mm -hmm. and we just get completely ignored. They found in Tucker Carlson a useful figure. Yeah, well, uh, a useful and, idiot. His, his yeah, ex-colleague yeah, yeah, I mean, at Fox News, Chris Wallace, said that uh, he, he, would, he didn't want to call him a useful idiot because that would be insulting to useful idiots. Useful idiots. <laughs> I mean, he, he, he's the Lord Haw Haw of the modern era mm. um, with a massive following on the far right, a very close relationship with Donald Trump, even though we've all now seen private emails that Tucker Carlson sent while he was at Fox News describing Donald Trump as an idiot and infuriated mm. uh, by Donald Donald Trump's response to the January the 6th uh, uprising uh, on Capitol Hill. But he's definitely got political viability here, which speaks, of course, to the lurch to the right that this country has taken. I yeah. mean, in an earlier era, he would be accused of treason and put on trial. Yep. Uh, that ain't going to happen here because uh, he will, uh, of course, be covered by the First Amendment, which allows him pretty much to do anything that he wants. Uh, but an extraordinary moment to see Vladimir Putin basically hectoring him at times and lecturing him. Um, and, and, you know, very... I mean. I guess the big takeaway from the interview is that Vladimir Putin wants the United States to persuade Ukraine to give up some territory. Mm. No surprise there. Uh, the clear indication being that Putin is hoping that Donald Trump becomes president so that he will uh, encourage Vla uh, Volodymyr Zelensky in Kiev yeah. uh, to give up some territory. Um, what struck me was how close... They were sitting. I know. They, they weren't well, yes. sitting either side of that stupidly long table. <laughs> Absolutely. You sort of wondered whether they'd walked in there and there had been that stupidly long table and Tucker Carlson had said, no, mate, we're not doing it that way. Because, I mean, you know, when he's seen other foreign leaders, let, let alone I mean, other foreign media figures, there have been other interviews that he's given. He gave one uh, to Chinese state media, uh, I think, about two, three months ago. Uh, and the reporter from China uh, was absolutely kept at beyond arm's length. But there's sitting there, what, you know, three or four feet apart. Mm. So, clearly good pals. Now, uh, you mentioned uh, Donald Trump. He, of course, uh, had this, um, what some people are calling an extraordinary speech, where uh, he starts by saying, um, a very important person called me sir. And you pretty much know that what <laughs> follows that is uh, uh, some far distance from the truth. But he was talking about uh, NATO and mm. whether he would um, come to a country's uh, rescue, you know, the, uh, the, the, as, 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 uh, as the leading, uh, uh, country in, uh, NATO to come to their rescue should they be, uh, attacked and, uh, said essentially no, not unless they paid their dues. Yeah, I mean, they've got to pay their subscription or he would not come to their aid, which, of course, would completely breach uh, the collective defence nature of NATO, underscored by Article 5 of the Convention that everybody signs, an attack on one is an, atta is, uh, an attack on all. Uh, he said not only would he not come to the aid of any country that had not paid its way, but he would actually encourage Russia to attack the country that had not paid its way. Mm. I mean, jaw-droppingly irresponsible and crazy, but also foolish tactically. You and I were talking last week about whether Donald Trump could maintain the discipline necessary to propel him through a nine-month election campaign. You, 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 he spent the weekend... I mean, this was a weekend when the national conversation was absolutely set to be focused on Joe Biden's mental ag agility. All of these questions about Joe Biden's memory uh, coming out of that special prosecutor's report into uh, Joe Biden's mishandling of classified documents. Donald Trump should have said nothing this weekend that was going to detract from the attention that was being placed on that memory issue because it's catastrophic for Joe Biden. And he can't help himself. Instead, he's got to get the Klieg lights back on him. Mm. So he makes these absurd assertions that only underscore the threat that a Trump presidency is going to uh, uh, pose uh, to the country's traditional allies in Europe, to its NATO partners, 
is. And suddenly the conversation becomes at the very least bifurcated with people saying, well, hang on a second, we shouldn't be talking about Joe Biden's memory. We ought to be talking about the threat that Donald Trump poses. This guy could spark off World War Three. So, I mean, in terms of the question we were asking ourselves last weekend, can he retain discipline? I mean, I think it's been asked and answered. Yes. Now, on a more superficial level, what colour is his face now? <laughs> <laughs> because it's it's not orange anymore, is it? It's a sort of, I don't know how to describe it. It's a really unpleasant shade of sort of sewage brown. It's like it all he's looks been, a bit henna. It looks a bit henna. It's, it's, it? it's like he's been swimming in Lake Windermere. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, yes, maybe he has. Uh, yes, I mean, certainly uh, his appearance continues to defy description. Um, and, uh, you know, we're going to be seeing an awful lot more of him. So we'll be able to we'll get a colour chart going, I think, <laughs> fairly soon to get a sense of which direction it's going. Yeah. But look, I mean, he's still riding high in the opinion polls. He, mm -hmm. he hit out at Nikki Haley, his last remaining rival yesterday, again grabbing some headlines by uh, disparaging her husband who is serving with the U.S. military, I think in Djibouti at the moment. Um, and, uh, you know, he is still absolutely on course to become the Republican Party standard bearer this November. There doesn't seem to be anything that diverts him from that. Um, and, and even these explosive comments that he makes just cement people's support around him yeah. uh, on the Republican side. Now, I know that the New York Times, which is a sort of left-leaning, small-l liberal, paper, they've had for three days in a row opinion pieces just lashing Joe Biden, essentially saying that he shouldn't be in the running. Mm. Look, the White House has got a massive problem, and as much as they insist that this is all the media, it's all the fault of the media, uh, President Biden last week bellowed at a reporter who asked him why uh, a growing number of Americans are, are questioning his capacity and his mental agility. And he said, you're saying that. It, it, you, that's you who's saying that. Well, it, it's not that reporter who was saying that because she was citing last week's poll by NBC, which shows that 76% of voters, three quarters of them, and this survey was taken before uh, the special prosecutor's report hit, have questions about whether Biden has the capacity to serve four more years in the Oval Office. This spe they're railing against the special prosecutor. He's a Trump Republican. They're furious with Merrick Garland, Biden's own attorney general, until last week, a Democratic Party folk hero, but they're all turning on him for appointing Robert Hur, this special prosecutor, uh, in the first place, suggesting that all he needed to do was clear Joe Biden of any wrongdoing with the the classified documents, there was no need for the narrative. Robert Hur clearly was shocked by the state of Joe Biden's cognitive capacities during the course of the interviews that his investigators conducted with Joe Biden and as demonstrated in a 2017 audio tape of a conversation between Joe Biden and his ghostwriter that was at the heart uh, of some of these investigative inquiries and he decided um, for whatever reason that he needed to make it clear that one one conclusion that he'd reached was that you couldn't bring criminal charges against Joe Biden because he's defence lawyers would be able to walk into court and say that the president's memory is faulty. He didn't remember he had these classified documents in his garage uh, and in his private home. And that's one of the... They basically decided Joe Biden was too forgetful so you couldn't secure a conviction. And the longer this goes on, the more problematic it becomes. White House insiders acknowledge they can't do anything about Joe Biden's age. You can't stop his, his age from advancing. Even on Thursday night in the press conference that he held, designed to demonstrate his mental acuity, he confused the president of Egypt with the president of Mexico. Yeah. So that was just a, a stunning own goal. This story is not going away. And it, uh, just one last point. It was notable that Joe Biden had lunch yesterday with his sister Valerie, who is a pivotal advisor to him. And it would have been fascinating to be a fly on the wall for that conversation. Yeah, but the other side uh, are also suffering in this regard because uh, Donald Trump was uh, talking about the attack on America on 9-11 and he kept referring to it as, as 
it, it happening on 7-Eleven, which is a supermarket. Yes, yes, and he's also confused Nikki Haley with Nancy Pelosi, uh, insisting that Nikki Haley was the person who didn't adequately defend the Capitol on January the 6th when he meant Nancy Pelosi. And, uh, you know, clearly both men have issues and difficulties. Donald Trump in his rally speech over the weekend was at points slurring his words again. Uh, th- but the problem for the White House is that you can't keep saying, well, if you think our guy's bad, look at the <laughs> other fella. <laughs> yeah. I mean, because that only underscores that we're hurtling towards a rematch of 2020 that the vast majority of Americans would prefer was not happening. Yeah. You know, e- privately, the vast majority, I don't know a single Democrat in this town, privately, who wouldn't infinitely prefer Joe Biden to announce that he was stepping aside and allowing an open primary contest to begin to determine his successor. Mm. Well, it's a good job that neither man is angling to do a job of any importance, then, isn't <laughs> exactly. it? Exactly. <laughs> Simon, thanks very much for that. That's Simon Marks, LBC's Washington correspondent.